It's time to argue now. He's getting into the meat of his, his, uh, his argument, his, his point that he wants to make. He's a legitimate apostle, and now we're getting into the meat of it. And his opening statement, I think, is, is funny. You idiots. That's his opening statement. He's making his case, he's making his argument, and he starts with, you idiots. I mean, he says, you foolish Galatians. We don't usually use the word foolish that often, but I do hear the word idiots a lot. So this is basically what he's saying. You idiots. And then he repeats it a couple of verses later. Are you that idiotic? One translation actually has it. You stupid people in Galatia. It's not usually a way that you would begin an argument. This is a pretty serious matter. They have turned away from a gospel by grace alone and they think that they need to earn their salvation. And he's slapping them up on the side of the head. What is wrong with you? Are you mental? Get with the program here. This is not what you heard. So in verses 1 through 5 is his first argument. Argument number 1. He basically says... The Holy Spirit came to you before you observed the law. Before you observed the law. Needing to do something for salvation is totally against their experience. He says, I came to you and I preached to you the gospel and then the Holy Spirit came. And this was evidenced by by miracles that were done among you. You think that that happened because you observed the law? No, that's not how it works. Your own experience goes against this. What, what is wrong with you people? So now, now you're going backwards. You, you had the Spirit, and now you think that you need to earn it. That doesn't make any sense. Verse 3, if you translate it literally, it says, After beginning in Spirit, you are now finishing in flesh. Okay, so the Spirit came, and now you're trying to use fleshly means to attain the Spirit. What? That that, that doesn't make any sense. Are you so foolish, he says. It doesn't make sense here. Your own experience contradicts this. That's his first argument. Argument number two is in verses 6 through 14. And he starts talking about Abraham. It seems evident that these people who were stirring up this trouble, one of their arguments probably was Abraham was circumcised. Therefore, you have to be circumcised too. If you want to be saved, if you want the promises of God, then you must be circumcised because Abraham was. And so now Paul's ripping into this. No, this is not how it works. Abraham was righteous by believing, not circumcision. He said, if you actually go back and read the story of Abraham, it says God gave him this promise. And what happened? It says Abraham believed God, and then it was credited to him as righteousness. Not he was circumcised and it was credited to him as righteousness. No, he believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham, he says in this way, is a template for all people who believe. Jews and Gentiles. He's like, that's including you people, he says. Abraham is a template for that. He believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Righteousness basically means you are right with God. You're in a right standing, a right relationship with God. Abraham believed and that was righteous. In verse 10, he says basically absolutely everyone who tries to be right with God by the law fails. If you try to earn your salvation, if you try to earn that righteousness, being right with God, you fail because if you want to do it that way, you have to be absolutely perfect in every respect. That's how the law works. In order to succeed by the law, you have to be absolutely perfect from the inside out. And so if you miss one thing, you are no longer fulfilling 
what the law requires. You have to follow the whole law if you're going to do it that way. But Jesus here, he says, Jesus saved us from that. So we don't have to earn God's favor. We don't have to earn that righteousness. We don't earn our standing before God. Living by law is actually evidence of unbelief. There's, a, there's actually a, a minister in a church called the United Church of Canada. Her name is Greta Vosper. And she's in Toronto. And she is actually an atheist, an open atheist. And she wrote this book called With or Without God, Why the Way We Live is More Important Than What We Believe. If you're an atheist, belief doesn't matter. It's all about how you live. It's about law. It's about conduct. It's about earning things. If you have faith, then the works have a different meaning. Faith is what we're about. What you believe is actually more important than what you do. That's what we maintain. That's what the Bible says. So by believing... Verse 14, by believing in Christ, we receive the blessings of Christ. That's that's the logic that's being used here. If you believe in Christ, then all of those blessings that he has are imparted to you. You belong to him. You get to share in all of his blessings, all his advantages, all his privileges by believing in him. Not, Not belief and then do this, 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 and this. That's not how it works. So by faith, you and I are right with God. We have a right standing before God, and we can come before God. This is why we can pray, because we are in Christ. If without Christ, we could not do that. We couldn't do it, because we are not good enough. We are not holy enough to stand before a perfect God. And then verses 15 through 25, this is argument number three. And this is basically that God's promise came before the law. God made promise, and then the law came. The law was not attached to that promise. It came afterwards. In fact, it came 430 years later. What really stands is this promise here. The law was kind of a conditional promise situational sort of a thing. So he starts by saying, even human contracts cannot be changed after both parties sign, so all the more with contracts with God. So even in our own experience, he says, if you have a contract between two parties and those people both sign, that contract is valid unless both people agree to changes later on. This is how it works. How, why not with God's contracts? If God made a contract with Abraham and his descendants after him, then that contract stands. The law doesn't change what was in that first contract because it came later. The promise still stands. It said if we were right with God by law, then that law would have come first or it would have been attached to that promise. But it wasn't attached to the promise. It came 430 years later. This promise is what we stand on. The law was a temporary measure. It was there for a time. It's not about law. Verse 19, the law was to show us our sin. So he says in 19, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. It's to show us our sin. There's a couple different uses of the law that, that uh, students of the Bible talk about. And this is, this is one of the ones that Paul is highlighting here. This is to show us that we're sinners, that we, we can't earn our salvation. We need a Savior. And so it points ahead to a Savior. 
and says, you can't do it. You need, you need help. You need salvation. Verse 22, it says, the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. We all need salvation. This is not just for the Jews. This is for everybody. Everybody needs this salvation. And there's only one salvation. So the law identifies symptoms of our disease, if you will, by analogy. Just identifying your symptoms, that's not enough to cure you. You take medicine for a cure or something along those lines. Identifying the symptoms does not cure you. I mean, it'd be kind of ridiculous if we went to our doctor and with, we had a cold, we had a cough and sore throat and a headache and, and the doctor looks at these symptoms and says, okay, you, you, have, you have this cold here or this flu. So stop doing it. Stop, stop the headache and stop your sore throat and just, yeah, just cut it out. That's, that's not how it works. The law was a temporary measure. The promise was permanent. The promise was permanent from the beginning and then the law came later to add to, add to our knowledge of what's going on here. So the law is not attached to that promise. It's not making the promise conditional. The promise is permanent. And circumcision, which was a key topic here, this was a sign of the promise. It was not attached to that promise. Circumcision actually came later too. It's a sign of the promise. It's not the promise itself. So we just had a baptism today. We believe that baptism replaces circumcision. It's not the promise itself. It's a sign of that promise. It's a seal of that promise. It gives us something that we can see and touch that shows us what God is doing. So God's promise came and then came the law. And that law points to Christ. I want to call your attention to a couple of things. If you have your Bibles open, look at verse 24. It says the law was put in charge to lead us there. You see that? And then in verse 25, it says supervision of the law. There's, there's one word that covers both of those. And it's, it's called pedagogos. It's where we get our word pedagogy it's basically a schoolmaster schoolmaster that's how the King James translates it the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ there's other words that are used to translate it too but in Greek culture there would be if you were a wealthy family and you had a bunch of slaves there would be one slave that would be in charge of overseeing the children Kind of like your functioning guardian. And that slave would be responsible for, you know, helping the kids with the homework, getting them to and from school, and administering a lot of discipline. He said that's what the law is. The law is one of those people. So this actually gives a good comparison, I think. Where faith is like family. And the law is like school. We all have families and we've all been to school, so this, this actually, I think, kind of works for us. In school, you earn grades. You have to merit peer approval. You are awarded for achievements. You take tests and exams. It's rigorous. And you can be expelled if you do the wrong things. Family doesn't work that way. It's a little bit different. Family, you have your status from birth. You belong to a family because you were born in a family. So like with Christ, it says you need to be born again. This is what it means to belong to the family of God. You are born into a new family, the family of God. That's salvation. 
In a family, mom and dad love you no matter what. Now, you can misbehave and, and do bad things, and that displeases them, that disappoints them, and they, they get upset by that, but they, that doesn't mean they stop loving you. That's how it works with God, too. We can, we can disappoint Him, but that doesn't mean He stops loving us. We, we, we already belong because we've been born again into this new family. God is our Father. In a family, you're appreciated regardless of your achievements. In some families, you have some overachievers and you have some underachievers. But each one still belongs to the family. And at least in a good family situation, both children are, are prized and loved for who they are, not for what they achieve. And if you misbehave, mom and dad are never going to expel you. That's not how it works. When you belong to a family, you're there. And you might be disciplined, you might be put in timeouts and get grounded and all that kind of stuff, but you're not going to get kicked out of the family. When God is our Father, as Jesus taught us to call Him, this is what it means. So family does send you to school, though, because it's important. It's good for our development. It's good for understanding who we are and how we need to live in this world. So the family does send you to school. It is important, but you do graduate. And then you're done with school. It's not a permanent position that you have. It's not a permanent thing that you do. You finish school, and then you go into a line of work of some kind. So the same way, God sends us to the law because we need it. It's good for us. It trains us. It gets us to see things the way we need to see them. But we graduate from that, and we don't have to go back to it. And so in the whole history of God's salvation, if you want to look at it this way, the law was there for a time. But then, when Christ came, we don't need to do that anymore. We graduated from that. The overarching point here in what we just read is something that we learned in the Reformation. It's called sola fide. Faith alone. We are saved by faith alone. We are saved by believing, not by doing. Just like in a family. You don't earn your position in a family. You're born into it. We are born into the family of God by believing, not by doing. We are saved by God's grace alone through faith alone. And so we stand right with God by believing. Just believing. And that is really liberating. That is freeing. That delivers us from burdens that we can't imagine. If you've ever been in a position where you felt like you weren't good enough for God, and you had to shape up in order for Him to be pleased with you, this is good news. This is what happened with Martin Luther. He felt like he had to earn his salvation for most of his life, or most of his young life anyway. And then, as he was studying, he came across a verse. That verse is in your Bible reading tracks this week. And this light bulb goes off. And suddenly all of this clicks. Saved by faith alone. So I'm going to put his words, this is what he wrote up on the screen here. My situation was that although an impeccable monk, and monks are in rigorous training, you know, they, they give their whole lives to doing what God wants, all that kind of stuff. I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Then I grasped 
that the justice of God is that righteousness by which, through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. If you have a true faith that Christ is your Savior, then at once you have a gracious God. For faith leads you in and opens up God's heart and will. That you should see pure grace and overflowing love. This it is to behold God in faith, that you should look upon his fatherly heart, in which there is no anger nor ungraciousness. So he went from, I have to earn God's favor. God is a just God, and I've got to get everything right. Otherwise, he's going to hate me. To, God loves me because I believe in him. That's all. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. Why do you say that by faith alone you are right with God? It is not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. So Christ is our righteousness. And when we believe in Him, we get all of His blessings. And that righteousness is ours. And so when we go before God in prayer, for example, we stand before God spotless. And we can talk to Him as if He was our own Father because we are in Christ. I hope that I hope that that means something to you today. Because that is amazing news. Now, some people think or have thought that grace alone or faith alone rather means faith only. You just have to check a box that say I believe and then you're done. That's all that you have to do. Good works are still important, but they are an automatic result of faith. So that needs to be stressed. It's not faith only. Faith, true faith, leads to good works, a changed life. It's an automatic result. It's a knee-jerk reaction. If you have true faith, your, your life is going to change. So faith doesn't stand alone, but it saves alone. You're not saved at the moment when you start doing good things, you're saved at the moment you believe. And then comes the rehab process. So in Hebrews 11, there's a whole history of the Old Testament that it recounts. It says this whole Bible that we have here is all about people with faith. This is what the stories are about. And not just faith, it's about how they lived out that faith. So actions are important, they incur together with faith, but they don't save you. You're not saved by what you do. Well, after, shortly after the Protestant Reformation got started and people were saying, well, by, by faith alone, uh, the Catholic Church made this pronouncement. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also increased, before God through good works, but that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. At best, that anathema means cut off from the church. In other words, your good works are a crucial, essential part of your salvation. You have to have them. So you are saved by believing and doing. Whereas we maintain that we are saved by faith alone. Faith that works, but faith alone. So faith without works actually is not real faith. 
If you think that faith just means checking a box or just saying, I believe, then that's not true faith. That's not real faith at all. And James hits this really hard because he's addressing people who just says, well, I, I, yeah, I believe, sure, but then I do whatever I want. No, that's not how it works. James 2.22, it says, Abraham's faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And he even, and James even says it this way, and some people try to throw this and say, well, no, we're not saved by faith alone. He says this, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. But you could also translate, translate that faith only. If you just have faith and it doesn't live out at all, that's not real faith. So as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You're going to read the whole passage this week in your Bible reading tracks. So works are still important. They're a natural result of faith, but these do not save you. We all have problems of living Christian lives, don't we? But these problems with Christian living and good works, they're not the problems that we think they are. So, when you're supposed to be nicer or to give more or to volunteer more, for example, these are good Christian things to do, if you're supposed to do that more, that really kind of sounds a lot like exercise more eat healthier, spend more time with your kids, your husband, your wife, your parents. Kind of like a list of, I should do this, I should do this. But our challenge is not to do more. It's to believe more. If good works naturally result from faith, then let's not put the cart before the horse. The challenge for us is to believe more. If you need to be nicer, then the problem isn't your actions, it's your beliefs. If you need to give more, then the problem is not giving, it's believing. If you need to volunteer more, then the problem is not volunteering, it's believing. And if you need to witness to your neighbor, the problem is not fear. It's not that you're introverted. It's not that you don't know what to say. The problem is that you don't believe very much. Your faith is weak. And so we say with the man whose son Jesus healed, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That's our prayer before God. So even though we say that we're saved by faith alone, we get caught up into this I should this good works sort of thing. Really the challenge is to believe more. And then the works come after that. Our real problem is weak faith. Our real problem is that we don't really believe God will take care of our needs. We have to take care of ourselves. That's what we really think deep down. At least when I search my own heart, when I hear some people talk, this is, this is what I pick up. We don't really believe true life is hidden with Christ and God. We'd sooner miss time with God than, say, a doctor's appointment. We don't really believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength because we spend so much time trying to keep ourselves happy with what we buy or what we watch or what we do. Our problem is weak faith, people. It's not about we need to do more. It's we need to believe more. One of the recurring things that Jesus said to his disciples is not do more, it's you of little faith. Making an effort without faith brings just discouragement. When you just try to do something without really believing in it, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for burnout. Anybody can make more effort for a time, but unless you believe in what you're doing, you're going to become exhausted and you're going to revert back to old patterns. So if you've ever tried to diet or exercise, for example, unless you really believe that you need to do this, you're going to revert back to old patterns. And you're just going to get discouraged. Like, I can't do that. That's too hard. 
Because if you don't believe in it, you're not going to actually follow through with it for an extended period of time. It takes a lot of energy to do a changed life, to change your habits. And you need to believe in that in order to actually be successful in it. And the same is true with our faith. If we need to be, live better Christian lives, our challenge is not to just do more. Our challenge is to believe more. How do we do that? We grow in faith by studying the Word, prayer, and taking risks to obey. Being in God's truth, talking to God about that truth, and then trying things out that God tells us to do, even if we're a little bit afraid or unsure. Let's grow our faith because we are saved by faith alone. We are not about works. Works flow out of faith. Let's make sure that we have that faith. And let's bow our heads and pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a God who is gracious enough to, to extend us salvation simply by believing. But Lord, we often get caught up in what we should do. And we get focused on that. Instead of our faith, we focus on how we're not measuring up. Lord, we pray that you would renew our hearts, our minds, and our eyes to see that, Lord, we need to grow in our faith. We need to believe more. We need to trust you more. So, Lord, please help us to do that through your word, through prayer, Lord, through taking those risks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.